Tonight, Marta is joining us to discuss her new book, Gardening Can Be Murder, How Poisonous Poppies, Sinister Shovels, and Grim Gardens Have Inspired Mystery Writers. Tonight's program is presented in partnership with Glencoe and Highland Park Public Libraries. Thanks to the bookstall for supporting this event with online sales. A link to purchase Gardening Can Be Murder from the bookstall can be found in the chat box on your screen. Purchases of the book will support the bookstall, a local bookstore. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Marta McDowell teaches landscape history and horticulture at the New York Botanical Garden and is a popular lecturer and writer. Her latest book, Gardening Can Be Murder, about the horticultural connections to crime fiction, she's discussing here tonight, and it was published in September. Timber Press also published Unearthing the Secret Garden, Emily Dickinson's Gardening Life, The World of Laura Ingalls Wilder, New York Times bestselling All the President's Gardens, and Beatrix Potter's Gardening Life, which is now in its ninth printing. Marta was the 2019 recipient of the Garden Club of America's Sarah Chapman Francis Medal for Outstanding Literary Achievement. And we're so glad to welcome Marta this evening. Thank you, Beth. And thank you, Grace, as well, and the Glencoe Library, as well as the Highland Park Library for having me. And thank you all for coming. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about my latest book. Uh, as Beth said, it's called Gardening Can Be Murder. And what I like to do with my books is give myself a different way or a different window to look at books through gardening and give myself a different way to look at gardening through the reading I do. So I, I often think that I was predestined to be a writer, even though it's really my second career, because this is me age two. Uh, I was the youngest of four children. This was the Christmas uh, that I, I guess I had just turned two years old. So we would have been at this point in South Pasadena, California. Uh, I was born in California and we moved not long after this picture was taken to New Jersey, where I have lived ever since. Uh, actually, my mother is from central Illinois, so I spent my summers in Illinois. Uh, but this particular Christmas, we got this typewriter as the family Christmas gift. And the story goes that I just would not get up from this typewriter and kept pushing the keys going, I type, I type, uh, which is kind of interesting because I do now spend quite a bit of my time at the keyboard. Uh, while it's not a typewriter, it is still very much a keyboard. Uh, so I came to... Uh, reading actually before I came to gardening. Uh, I was quite a reader, as was every person in my family. Uh, so of course, I started with the books that were on our shelves. My brother was the oldest. He was older than me by 10 years. Uh, and so of course, I started with his Hardy Boys, uh, you know, sort of adventurous tales of boys solving crimes or, you know, coming up with the answer to the mystery. And I'll bet that many of you already know what I moved on to next. And yes, that was very much uh, my sister's stack of Nancy Drews. Uh, so we didn't have all of them, uh, but, you know, we had quite a few of each. And these were the editions of Nancy Drew that I remember. Uh, it's, they're not the first editions, but they were the ones that were coming out uh, in the late 50s and early 60s uh, when I was, you know, my sisters and I were reading them. Uh, Nancy Drew was a, a very well-rounded youth. Uh, she was basically good at everything. I sometimes wonder why I didn't grow up with some sort of, you know, because inferiority complex is what we used to call it. Uh, because regardless of the subject area, she seemed to excel. That was very deliberate uh, in that, uh, 
each of the Nancy Drew books was about a different topic. And so it was part of, you know, exploring different interest areas to encourage, in this case, girls to be interested in a lot of different kinds of things. So, of course, there is a gardening one. And Password to Larkspur Lane actually first came out in 1933. And it is about gardening. This was the original edition and its dust jacket. Uh, in the beginning of the story, Nancy is working on her flower bed uh, and she is growing larkspur or delphinium. And the story actually talks about, you know, what, why is it called delphinium and the connection to the Greek god Apollo and the oracle at Delphi. And when I was rereading this book for the purpose of this project, I thought, geez, I didn't remember this much detail, but I thought that was fun. So Nancy picks a bunch of her larkspur and enters them in a flower show. And of course, as you can see in this picture, uh, you know, if you exclude the dog for a moment and just look at the at the vase full of flowers, you'll see that Nancy has taken first place uh, in her, you know, group of larkspur that she's brought in. But of course, mysterious things start happening and this Doberman comes in to the display house where they're having this flower show and I guess attacks the flowers, doesn't actually attack Nancy, but you know, it, it's part of the story. Uh, that is Larkspur in my garden. I'll show you a couple of pictures of my garden as we go along. Uh, and again, it just gives me a little connection to the stories that I'm reading. Now, the actual mystery about the Nancy Drew series is one that you probably know the solution to, many of you, although I will say last week, I, um, I, I think I really shocked someone in my audience that day because there is no Carolyn Keene. Carolyn Keene is an invention of the company that created the Nancy Drew series and many other series. It was called the Stratemeyer Syndicate. Uh, they published series of books for young people. Now we tend to call that young adult or YA fiction. Uh, that's a more recent term. But Carolyn Keene was a whole stable of writers. Uh, one of that stable and one of the very prolific ones was Mildred Wirt Benson. Uh, she was an Iowan. She went to the University of Iowa. They are the ones who hold her papers. Uh, and as you can see from these stacks of books, she wrote all sorts of other uh, books as well, the Brownie Scouts and various things. But she wrote lots of Nancy Drews. However, not as it turned out, Password to Larkspur Lane. That was written by another author named Walter Kerrig, another American writer. Uh, these were ghost writers. They were unable contractually to share that they were writing Nancy Drew stories. Uh, that was, for, you know, held for a long time, for decades and decades, until they won a lawsuit and could finally reveal that. Uh, there are still Nancy Drew stories coming out, and some contemporary uh, crime writers like Susan Wittig Albert have also, you know, taken their turn as Carolyn Keene. But I love this picture of Walter Kerrig with the cigarette hanging out of his mouth and the little, the little Siamese cat uh, in front of the typewriter. Uh, I graduated to the public library and, uh, you know, we were really a library family. We would go at least once a week. You know, I could walk from the home to the library after not too many years. And they always had a good mystery section, uh, both in the kids room where I started out. And then eventually, you know, I graduated to the adult room, which seemed very exciting and started reading uh, authors like Phyllis A. Whitney, oh, you know, Mary Reynolds, and then um, Agatha Christie, and, you know, sort of on from there. And I read a lot of different kinds of uh, books, fiction and nonfiction and various genres, but there are always a few mysteries uh, in the stack of books that are, you know, waiting for me to read. 
this particular book that I wrote, Gardening Can Be Murder, has a real connection to the public library, particularly the one in my town, because I decided to write it during the pandemic. Uh, I really needed a project to work on. And the typical subject that I choose usually involves spending a lot of time in archives. And that was not open to researchers. You know, archives were shut down just as everything else was. And even when the archivists started going back into work, they were so uh, kind of overwhelmed with researchers trying to get material scanned. It, it was really a problem. So I wanted something that would be a little easier and uh, I could still get books out of my library system. Uh, you know, our, our librarians, I guess they were, you know, going in one at a time and they would put our books in little paper bags and write our names on them and leave them in the back hallway and we'd come in in our masks and pick them up. So I just read stacks and stacks of mysteries in preparation for writing this book. I also want to mention the illustrations in my book uh, and the illustrator. Um, you know, I needed some illustrations. The publisher told me up front, you know, no color, only black and white. And I have a friend who is a graphic artist and a fabric designer. Yolanda, you can see all the stacks of her fabric samples behind her, uh, or some of them. She also designs quilts. But I, um, I guess we emailed or maybe we FaceTimed. And I said, you know, would you have time to work on this project? And she said, well, give me some ideas of the sorts of things that you are thinking about. And I said, well... You know, I always liked the artwork of Edward Gorey. Uh, if the name sounds familiar, it may be because you watch uh, Masterpiece Mystery. Um, you know, the little animated figures that are at the beginning, you know, like the fainting woman and stuff. Th those are his characters that were animated for that sequence. He did other things. He uh, designed the sets and I think the costumes for a big production of Dracula. He was very involved in drama. He did a lot of unusual little books. Uh, and so I said, you know, I liked his style. Uh, I also liked silhouettes, you know, those kind of black cutouts. And the other thing I mentioned to her was when I was growing up, I really liked a particular magazine. It was called highlights for children. Uh, it may still be coming out. Uh, we did not subscribe. My parents were quite thrifty, uh, but it made going to the dentist or doctor's office something that I kind of looked forward to because I would pick up whatever issue they had and look for a particular uh, feature, which was find the hidden objects. They'd have these black and white illustrations and within them, they'd have little other things hidden in kind of funny ways. And then they'd tell you the things to look for. So Yolanda took all of this and she said, okay, give me a couple of days and I'll see what I can put together. And she sent me a sample and this is what she sent. And I said, you know, you're brilliant. You know, you took all these vague things. And I think that, uh, you know, she really got the idea. So we went on from there. Now, the book is divided up into sort of the components of a crime fiction novel, or at least a typical one. So you know, there's always some kind of sleuth. They might be a professional sleuth, like a police officer. They might be, you know, a forensic, you know, pathologist or some kind of amateur or, a, you know, a private detective. Uh, and quite a few of them have gardened over time. So the very first one appears in a, an old novel, you know, from the Victorian era, an English novel called The Moonstone. Uh, it is there's not a murder mystery, but it's definitely a mystery. He calls it a romance. Um, probably an English professor would tell you it's a Gothic novel. Uh, and it's sort of all of those things. But there is a detective and there's certainly a mystery all around this big gem called the Moonstone. And the detective's name is Sergeant Cuff. 
So he's a part of Scotland Yard. Uh, Wilkie Collins, think of him the same era as Charles Dickens. So they were actually friends. Uh, and Sergeant Cuff it just loves roses. And he starts right at the beginning when he is introduced saying, you know, one day, please, God, I shall retire from catching thieves and try my hand at growing roses. So here in this illustration, he's talking to the rose gardener and, you know, they're discussing different ways of laying out the best kind of rose garden. And they're sort of entwined through the entire story. And rose growing was very, very popular in the second half of the 19th century, as it still is. Uh, moving on from the Moonstone to a more contemporary investigator or sleuth, and one of my personal favorites, and that is Miss Jane Marple. Uh, Miss Marple was a creation of Agatha Christie. Uh, she wa was the subject of, I think, 14 novels and numerous short stories uh, over the course of really several decades. I think she was first introduced in the 1920s, the late 1920s, uh, in a short story. And the last Miss Marple novel came out in 1976. Now, this was sort of problematic from Ag for Agatha Christie, even though she liked writing about the character of Miss Marple, because she said, well, when I introduced her, I should have made her a schoolgirl, because it's impossible that Miss Marple would still be alive. But she just kind of let that go and let her age be sort of, you know, undetermined, but older, right? I think in the very first short story, she describes her as elderly uh, and went on from there. So many, many actors have played Jane Marple. Uh, you know, here are, you know, this is just like a little inventory I did. Uh, I was surprised about Angela Lansbury. I associate her with Murder, She Wrote, but she was in for some made-for-TV movies playing Miss Marple. And through the course of all of these different novels and short stories, Agatha Christie has quite a bit of time to give a lot of different details about Miss Marble and how she learned about plant names from her governess and the different kinds of flowers she grew. She didn't really grow vegetables, but she did grow some herbs. Uh, she particularly mentions tansy for her grandmother's tansy tea. Uh, but if I go see Miss Marple in St. Mary Mead in her, you know, fictional village and fictional cottage, I want to come in the afternoon and hopefully get a sample of her damson gin. So this was gin that she laced with some of her plums. So that sounds good to me. So here is Joan Hickson, again, one of these actors playing Miss Marple in a garden setting. Uh, she had gardening friends, you know, in the, the fictional stories as well. So that's probably one of her friends' gardens, because I don't think she ever mentions a water feature in her cottage garden. Uh, but, you know, I still I kind of miss Miss Marple. I've watched all the different, you know, sort of video, you know, on video, either television or movie versions of Miss Marple. I've read all the novels and short stories. So last year I was really excited because I saw in a bookstore a new book, and this is what it looked like. And in big print, it said Agatha Christie Marple. And I thought, oh, they found more. Or, you know, they these were in like a safety deposit box and they're just releasing them. But in small print, it says 12 new mysteries and gives contemporary mystery writers like Val McDermott, I recognized, and Kate Moss and Ruth Ware. And many of you probably recognize others as well. But I did read these. They're a lot of fun. They all star Miss Marple as the detective, and quite a number of them are also on horticultural themes. So that was fun for me as well. So I recommend that. Another set that you can look for, my guess is they're in your library system, are the Brother Cadfile Chronicles by Ellis Peters. Uh, Ellis Peters is a pen name, the actual author uh, was named Edith Pargeter. Uh, she was a Brit. Uh, she lived in Shrewsbury 
which is where her novels are set. Shrewsbury is on the Welsh borders. That was always a contentious area uh, in England because Wales was always sort of, you know, wanted to be on independent, you know, and do its own thing and kind of, you know, sort of extract money that was coming from England into Wales. Uh, but they, there was a Benedictine Abbey there called the Abbey of St. Peter and St. Paul. Her novels are set in the 12th century. And uh, Ellis Peters, with this series, really established a subgenre, and that is historical crime fiction. Uh, it's very popular now. There are still a lot of, you know, a lot of Victorian murder mystery series and others as well. But she chose a more ancient time in British history. It's an interesting one because the 12th century was a period of civil strife. There were two contenders for the throne, uh, King Stephen and Empress Maud, who was the wife of the Holy Roman Emperor, but she also was a daughter of the prior king. So, you know, their various forces were fighting. And so they were, that is, again, wound into these novels. So if you're a history buff, particularly a British history buff, you'll find that very interesting. Uh, Brother Cadfile, as a character, was the herbalist. And certainly this big Benedictine abbey would have had an, a herbalist, someone who would raise and sort of prepare the herbs, as they say in England, uh, for medicinal purposes. And so, again, a lot of these, just by their nature, have things about gardening and about plants, particularly useful plants in them. Uh, if you want to watch it as opposed to read them, but they're excellent reads, uh, you can watch the old series uh, starring Derek Jacobi. So this was a British series that did show on the, the mystery, you know, masterpiece mystery or PBS mystery uh, quite a while ago, but you can still find them. I can get them in my library system. Okay, we'll move on. So that's the detectives. We'll move on to the scene of the crime. And again, this is one of Yolanda's wonderful uh, chapter openings that she did for me. Uh, notice the, the little toe sticking out of the pool of the fountain. Um, so you need a place to have the body discovered uh, or a setting for the novel overall. So a few examples. Again, I'm just going to give one or two examples for each area uh, out of the book. So this is a very famous garden, the garden at Sissinghurst, and specifically the White Garden. Sissinghurst is in the south of England, so it's south of London. And it's a garden that was designed uh, by a couple, Vita Sackville West, and her husband, Harold Nicholson. Uh, Vita was a writer. Uh, her husband was a diplomat. And they created this garden at their country place. Uh, and uh, it got to be well known, even in their lifetimes. But since then, it's really one of the, you know, worldwide most famous gardens. So the white garden is the part that you see just around that circular rondelle, which is what you call that sort of hedge feature that's made into a circle with paths going into it. And you'll see it's not all white, but there's a lot of white there. And that became particularly well known. Now, Vita and Harold had very wild lives. If you read their biographies, uh, you know, you'll it's kind of eye-opening. They were a part of the Bloomsbury Circle. And Vita herself uh, was the friend and sometimes lover of Virginia Woolf. So uh, they had very complicated, they all had very complicated relationships. Um, 
I will say, you know, Vita and Harold, they had two children and they had a very, you know, long and happy marriage. So go figure. Anyway, uh, Stephanie Barron, who's written other mystery series, uh, wrote a novel set in Sissinghurst. So much of the action takes place uh, in Sissinghurst or at the home of Virginia Woolf and her husband. Uh, and so it gives a lot of background about the White Garden. It is a, a novel that kind of moves back from the present to the past. So there is a protagonist in the present who's trying to solve a mystery and it involves the past and her grandfather who had also worked at Sissinghurst and it involves Virginia Woolf. And so, and as it says on its cover. Uh, so again, it's quite engaging, uh, particularly if you're interested in that period or those uh, authors or artists, uh, there's a lot in it. It's quite rich. And actually Stephanie Barron also wrote a series about Jane Austen. So that's also fun, but not about gardening. Uh, there was a garden described in one of Agatha Christie's novels in such detail, though without its name, I thought I can definitely identify this if it's a real place. And she talked about through the, the voice of Hercule Poirot, another, another of her detectives, uh, it talked about a garden off the coast of Ireland on a little island, a very elegant formal garden. Uh, and I did a little research and, you know, it's wonderful to have all these online tools and came up with this one, Ilna Cullen. Uh, it is a beautiful garden. I hadn't ever heard of it. Uh, it's now on my list of places I'd like to go visit. Perhaps some of you have. Uh, and it turned out that a couple of years before Agatha Christie wrote Halloween Party, she had visited Ilna Cullen. So not surprising that she used it as material for her next novel. Uh, the novel also has a very um, important rock garden, you know, described that's important to the plot. Uh, and I found it fascinating because this novel was the one adapted for the most recent Kenneth Branagh movie called A Haunting in Venice. But honestly, it was almost unrecognizable in the movie because the book has absolutely nothing to do with Venice. <laughs> so uh, it's, you know, it was a very loose adaptation. But anyway, an interesting read if you want to read about gardening. Uh, it is, I would say, not one of Agatha Christie's best mysteries, but it's really good for the gardening component. Another that I included that I will say, uh, this is kind of the opposite. It has a great gardening component. It has some mystery components, but it's not a classic, uh, you know, sort of detective fiction. Is Deacon King Kong by James McBride. Uh, I really love his writing. He's so good at character and plot development. Uh, and, uh, you may know him from The Good Lord Bird. That was a big novel. Uh, his most recent one was called The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store. I think that's doing well. Deacon King Kong, it has a shooting in it. Uh, there is a dead person, uh, although not murdered. Uh, there is an Irish cop who's trying to solve the crime that's involved. And there is this kind of unusual character who has a nickname, Deacon King Kong, who is a gardener. Uh, and so gardening and foraging are both a, components of this book and a very particular plant that I've always enjoyed. Uh, it is a moonflower, which is sort of like an evening morning glory. It sounds like a contradiction in terms, but it's the same family as morning glory, but instead of opening early, it opens late afternoon and it's white because it's moth pollinated. So here's moonflower growing in my garden. I'm sure you can grow it in the greater Chicago area. Uh, it's grown from seed. I plant the seed in the spring. By late summer, it's vined up 
you know, crawled up these little bamboo rods onto my fence and it'll actually crawl up over my gate. And then it gets these beautiful flowers. So they're really fun to see open. Uh, okay, so we've got detectives, we've got settings. Now we need a motive, right? So then you get into motive and means, you know, what, you know, why did they do it? How did they do it? And then of course, who did it? So motive, has gardening ever been used as the motive? Absolutely. So a garden has motivated whole plots, such as Deadheads. What a great title. So Deadheads starts out in a rose garden from the very first page. A rose garden drives the entire plot. Uh, it's a little bit... Uh, I don't know. There, there are many, many murders <laughs> in, in many different ways, and they all have to do with gardening and roses. So if you're interested in roses and a really good read, I'd say find a copy of Deadheads. This one was pretty beat up, but I think I got it, got it at a used bookstore. Uh, you can also watch it. So it's, again, one of those crime series that you can now get on DVD or stream if you have Masterpiece uh, Passport, if you're a PBS uh, member. So that's fun. And then the last one I'll mention is Turn of the Key. Now, I don't know how many of you have read Ruth Ware, but I have a suggestion if you haven't. And that is by all means read Ruth Ware, she has very, very well-crafted uh, crime thrillers, but do not read them as like bedtime reading because you won't be able to sleep. She writes these, you know, turn the page, very exciting books. Uh, and Turn the turn of the Key is no exception. Uh, it includes a poison garden, and that is why there is a key. Uh, it all It's kind of a gothic, dark novel. I was surprised at the very end, you know, the second to last page, I said, she's done it again. I'm totally surprised at the ending. I did not see that coming. So really fun. I did want to include the noir kind of subgenre, you know, this is hard boiled detective fiction. Uh, and I tried with no orchids for Miss Blandish. Ha ha. There are no orchids in no orchids for Miss Blandish, except in the title. Uh, you know, slugs in these books are bullets, right? They're not actual slugs like garden slugs. And, you know, so there's this whole vocabulary. So what I ended up using as an example is The Big Sleep uh, by Raymond Chandler. Uh, uh, and again, I remember best the Bogart movie. You know, this is one of these Bogart Bacall movies, The Big Sleep, uh, which has this wonderful scene in the Sternwood mansion uh, in this conservatory. And it's got this very vivid description of, you know, what it's like and what the atmosphere is like and what these orchids are like. So that was my little example of noir. Moving along, of course, the fun part, you know, fun. That's, you know, that's the kind of strangeness about murder mysteries. To me, I find them very relaxing, but they are all about death. So, you know, maybe it's our way of coping with death. I don't know. But at any rate, mulch. Uh, you know, dial M for murder, dial M for mulch. All the different ways you can really could kill someone with the stuff that I have, you know, hanging in my garage. Uh, this was a gift from my husband one Christmas. This is a Japanese soil knife. It's sometimes called a hori hori knife. They are extremely sharp when they're new. This one, uh, you know, it, mine is now dented up quite a bit from the stones in my soil, but uh, definitely could be a murder weapon. My pruning shears, you know, these little pickaxes or mattox, you know, all sorts of things. But my whole idea for this was kind of illuminated by reading this book. I think I read it in the late 90s, maybe around 2000. Uh, it was uh, a book by a garden writer who had turned to writing fiction. Anne Ripley was a Colorado, you know, journalist. And this was her first book. I picked it up because I was a gardener. 
And, you know, I started reading it. And the protagonist is also a garden writer. You know, just write what you know. And the she's set in Washington, D.C., in that area, sort of suburban Washington. And she has moved into a new house and wants to use, you know, fallen leaves as mulch. And she doesn't have enough of her own. So she starts to go around the neighborhoods near her and pick up other people's bagged leaves. At least in our neighborhoods, you can put your leaves out in these brown paper, you know, compostable bags. Uh, and then she finds body parts in some of these bags. So, you know, it, it, it's a tiny bit gruesome because, you know, you know the murder weapon is, you know, well, a chainsaw. Uh, so... At any rate, it made me think, well, there are a lot of gardening connections. Uh, for example, weed killer. Weed killer has been used in so many detective novels as a murder weapon. Uh, this is an old ad that I found on eBay from 1947, and it's bragging about, you know, this is arsenic. You know, it's like, why did we ever think that pouring arsenic in, on our soil was a good idea? But it has been handy handy for mystery writers, uh, including more contemporary ones like M.C. Beaton, another Brit. Uh, she writes a series starring Agatha Raisin. Actually, I don't know if M.C. Beaton's still with us or not, but Agatha Raisin uh, is very entertaining. You know, if you don't want a thriller and you don't want gruesome, read Agatha Raisin. Uh, she is funny she you know kind of stumbles into the answer to the mystery uh and she tries really hard but she's sort of goofy and uh the the tv series is very fun as well so in the potted gardener which is the one specifically about gardening uh she's trying to win the village you know most beautiful garden award and she you know kind of does all of these uh funky things and does end up winning but then gets disqualified and anyway it, it, it's fun okay and then of course poisons uh there have been many different books about plant poisons and their use you know there's a book on agatha christie's specific use of plant poisons uh, but i'll just pick out a few examples of common garden plants so I love foxglove. I grow lots of them. And yes, I could have told you it's a pharmaceutical. Uh, and yes, it's also toxic at a high dose. And so many plants, it all depends on the dosage, right? You take a little bit, it's, you know, it's beneficial. You take a lot, you're dead. Uh, so foxglove, uh, does appear in various places, including this book, which I loved Alan Bradley's mysteries. They star a young chemist. She's 11 years old when the series starts with sweetness at the bottom of the pie. Uh, and Flavia de Luce lives in England and she has a chemistry lab that her uncle left and she uses it. And she does things like, well, she extracts poison ivy and laces some of the extract in her sister's uh, lip balm. That doesn't seem like a very nice thing to do. Uh, you know, she describes how you would extract digitalin from garden foxglove. Don't try this at home. Uh, but, you know, as awesome as that sounds, <laughs> they are funny as well. Uh, there's my garden with its foxglove in the spring. So it sort of pops up where it wants to. It's just exactly my kind of garden plant. But I don't have it near my vegetable garden because you don't want to accidentally eat it. Now, I love rhubarb, and I've grown it in my garden beds uh, along with my flowers. Actually, since I did a book about Beatrix Potter, uh, who also uses rhubarb in one of her books, The Tale of Jemima Puddle Duck. Now, I like to pick it and eat it. And, you know, early on, I learned you only eat the stems. And I so I knew that probably the leaves weren't tasty, but I didn't know they were toxic, at least in a high enough concentration. They ha they're actually quite high in oxalic acid, which is what gives you, among other things, 
uh, kidney stones. So anyway, don't eat the leaves, stick to the stalks. But one crime fiction writer named Naomi Hirahara used those, that idea of rhubarb being toxic in one of her stories. And I do love her mysteries. Actually, she's got a series set, I think, in Chicago uh, that's newer. But her original mystery series uh, starred a protagonist, a Japanese-American named Mas Arai. And she patterned this fictional character on her father's life story because he was born in Southern California to immigrant parents. They sent him back to Japan for education. He got stuck in Japan during the Second World War because after Pearl Harbor, they did not allow even American, you know, Japanese American citizens to come back. And of course, in Southern California, the Japanese Americans were sent to internment camps. Uh, and so, you know, when he came back after the war, he, uh, you know, he, he got back in and his, you know, sort of family members and friends came back from the camps, but the jobs were quite limited. One thing they could get was gardening work. And so there were many, many Japanese American men who became landscape gardeners in Southern California, as her father did. So at any rate, she uses that as the basis for her character. She talks about a lot about the agricultural um, sort of industry in Southern California and about the history, particularly of Japanese Americans. So that was, they're quite interesting. And this one, all I can say is don't eat the pie. <laughs> And then you need clues, right? You have to have clues in mysteries. That's part of the formula. It's what readers expect. You know, I expect to have enough clues that if I can figure them out and I'm not like fooled by red herrings and other plot devices, then I should be able to puzzle out the answer. I can rarely do it, but occasionally I can. Actually, I feel, I always feel like I've, I've been cheated if I can figure it out. <laughs> but plants have been used as evidence in different uh, mysteries. So here's a plant that I grow. It's a rose, my favorite rose to prune. Uh, she's called Zephyrine Druhan. Uh, she's an old garden rose, very, very fragrant. And she has no thorns. So just great to prune this rose. No problem. I don't end up with puncture wounds uh, in my hands. Uh, this rose, with its name, was mentioned in a Hercule Poirot novel. I won't mention which one because it's a very key clue. So that really would be a spoiler. Uh, another novel that includes a uh, nasty plant, uh, even nasty in its botanical name, Tribulus terrestris, uh, it is puncture vine. You can see why it's called puncture vine. This is the bottom of someone's hiking boot. And it's all of these very sharp seed heads stuck in this thick sole. You can see they're very sharp thorns. So this is, you know, a defense mechanism for the plant. They're not poisonous, but they do stick to everything. It's not the only plant that does that. It's a way of seed distribution, but it's used by Tony Hillerman. May he rest in peace. Now his daughter's writing uh, novels of the Navajo uh, in The Wailing Wind. The Wailing Wind actually also is, uh, those are being adapted into a TV series. Uh, so Caltrop, it was such a funny word. Um you know, the seed that was used as a clue, I actually looked up the word and it turned out little, you know, this is, you know, for your Jeopardy or something, uh, that it's a little weapon that was used, if not invented by the ancient Romans. It was a spiked small piece of hard metal. So quite sharp. Think of it sort of like the size of the kind of jacks we used to play when we were kids, uh, but sharp and hard. And they would make these 
in the, you know, hundreds and thousands, I suppose, and to throw them out in front of oncoming armies as a way to deter soldiers. I mean, think of the damage to feet uh, and to hooves, like horses' hooves. So, you know, kind of gruesome in that sense. But it's used as a very interesting plot device for, you know, how to pinpoint where a murder actually took place place. And things like that are used uh, in forensic. So there are forensic botanists that analyze soil samples, for example, to see what kind of pollen is in the soil uh, and seeds as well. And then I would like to tell you that the butler has always done it, but sometimes it's the gardener and I'll just move us through this pretty quickly because I can tell I'm rattling on a little too long. Uh, this is, was a great favorite of mine. I discovered this, you know, sort of during the process of putting this novel together. Uh, the body is found in the garden. And from the very beginning, the gardener is a made suspect. Uh, it was written by... Elizabeth Ironside, a pen name for Lady Catherine Manning, who was the wife of the British ambassador to the United States. She's Oxford educated, it's very beautifully written. Uh, another example, Grave Mistake by Niall Marsh, who was among that sort of Agatha Christie, Dorothy L. Sayers group of writers. Uh, again, the gardener is one of the main suspects. And then to just close, the idea, again, of writers who garden. So I looked at Agatha Christie, who gardened, uh, particularly in her later years, although she grew up in a country home with a lovely garden that she enjoyed. Uh, with her second husband, she acquired Greenway in South Devon. This was close to where she grew up. It had a magnificent collection of rhododendron and camellia that they added to. And this is now a property of the National Trust. So you can visit this, which I'd like to do someday. Uh, Rex Stout was another writer, very prolific. Uh, he wrote a Nero Wolf series of some, I don't know, 30 or 40 novels. He wrote fast. Uh, and Nero Wolf was a great orchid fancier, again, played by many different people, as was his sidekick, uh, Archie Goodwin, including William Shatner played him once, which I thought was fun. But Rex Doubt had a huge collection of houseplants himself, some, something like 300 houseplants. Uh, there are, I think, 500 different named varieties of orchids in the Nero Wolf series, so that's for you orchid lovers. And Rex Stout also loved tall bearded irises. So that's fun. Uh, and uh, I'll include quickly Cynthia Riggs, who wrote a series of Martha's Vineyard mysteries starting in her 60s. She's still writing them. I think she's up to 15 or 16. Uh, and her protagonist is in her 90s. And Cynthia told me that she patterned this protagonist, Victoria Trumbull, on her mother, Dionys Riggs, who lived into her 90s, who was already, uh, you know, I don't know, 13th or 14th generation vineyarder. So Cynthia's got good credentials and gardens herself. Her mother was a great uh, wild plant enthusiast. And you can go stay at the Old Family Homestead in West Tisbury on Martha's Vineyard, if you like. Uh, of course, I had to include a New Yorker cartoon. Did you bring your garden gloves? <laughs> and I'll just close by saying, beware of how many murder mysteries you read, or your garden may end up looking like mine. All right. With that, I'll turn over to Grace and see what questions we might have. Okay. Marta, thank you so much. This was just the thing that we needed uh, <laughs> in a very, very cold month here. So um, your book like looks like a ton of fun. And I have to say it's one of the best titles I've heard lately. Um, so kudos to you for coming up with that one. <laughs> 
Um, I did want to ask um, you, Marta, myself, um, can you tell us a little bit more about your own garden? Oh, sure. Uh, I've showed you a little corner of it. Uh, we live in the suburbs and the property is fairly shady. Uh, we had a big hurricane come through. So we got a little extra sun by accident that way. But I love big trees. Uh, so, you know, where it's shady, I just deal with that and grow things that like the shade. So the front yard is very tiny. So it's close to the road and it's got big Norway spruce trees uh, and it's got a lot of deer. So out front, I grow ferns and other things that the deer don't eat or don't eat often because sometimes they'll still browse them. So grasses, you know, that tolerate shade, uh, little bulbs for the spring, lots of, it's called epimedium, which is a shade plant likes dry shade and no grass at all. So I'm sure like the neighbors think that I, you know, I'm different. <laughs> which I am. You uh, still want one of those dangerous mowers in your property. <laughs> <laughs> well, they still have to mow the back. <laughs> yes, I do have a patch of lawn. Uh, you know, I have a big sunny garden where I have sun. And other than that, again, lots of bulbs, ferns, little native bulbs. I have the back fenced because otherwise I couldn't grow a rose or a tulip. Uh, and then little boxes for vegetables. And I also have a couple of community garden patches. So that keeps me busy. <laughs> so really, I think you're a pr pretty obsessive gardener. Yeah, All I right? garden a lot. I Yes, I do. I do love it. So uh, I, although I will say because I garden at the keyboard a lot, uh, it's never particularly tidy. You know, I showed you some fairly tidy looking pictures, but th th they were on a good day. <laughs> Um, I wonder if there's a, a, when you're going through all the, you know, hideous things that can happen in beautiful places. Um, I, I was thinking about the, the role of the, the menacing hedge maze, which comes up, you know, like in The Shining, it comes up in Harry Potter, it comes yes. up in a couple of, did you come across a few more of those? Yes, there is. There's an old Getting one called, yeah, one. there's an old one called, I think, Murder in the Maze. Uh, mm -hmm. Harry, I mentioned Harry Potter because, of course, when I was talking to my granddaughters about this, they immediately said, well, you know, you have to include the maze from Harry Potter. I was like, OK, I can I can make that work. <laughs> that way I can include them in the acknowledgments. Um, yeah, so absolutely. You know, if it's like if it's there, a, a mystery writer will use it because you know, they need material. Yeah. Um, with some, with a few exceptions, it seems like all of the books that you mentioned are UK. Um, what is it about the Brits and their scary gardens? Um, well, about gardens in general, right? So mm -hmm. I was talking about talking about this with friends, you know, like on primetime TV in in Great Britain, in the UK, like Friday night, everybody turns on the gardening shows. So it's like, you know, for them, it's kind of a sport the way, you know, the way we'll watch, you know, sort of everyone will be watching some sport thing. Uh, you know, I just, it's a different culture. It's really, you know, it's really a part of it. Uh, I think, you know, part of, I, I guess what I selected tonight there were many, many British mysteries, but there are quite a few American ones as well. I wonder if it's also a tradition in some other other cultures. Um, but uh, certainly the Scandinavian scary mysteries that are out, so dominant out there, I don't think they ever take place in a garden. They take place in snow fields. Yes, I've never found one, although I did look. <laughs> Um, we have a few questions here. Um, um, oh, 
<laughs> Francesca says, this is funny. My husband weed whacked my carefully tended rhubarb plant last summer, killing it instantly. I think I, I'm thinking I need to grow another one and then use the leaves to do him in. Oh. <laughs> he only has one ki one kidney, so oxalic acid sounds perfect. What do you think? <laughs> oh dear! All right, well, I'll show you. I, I was I was in a bookshop actually signing books, and as I was going in, it, it was around Halloween, and they had a window display that was seasonally appropriate. And I said, I need one of the dish towels in your window. And here's what it says. Can you read that? Be nice to me or I'll poison your food. Yes. So anyway, that that really made me laugh. Uh, again, <laughs> I got my I think my spouse was worried some when, when I was writing this book. And I was like, what are you doing there? Well, I don't think Francesca's husband actually has to worry because she says, <laughs> okay, seriously, she enjoyed the, the talk. And she's, she's in New Jersey and um, hoping that you've read or soon will read Daniel Mason's North Woods. I have. I just finished it today, coincidentally. It is, a oh, wow. it is not, well, it's got, it, it has a lot of dead bodies, <laughs> but it's not, again, it's not classic detective fiction, but it, it's a fabulous read if you're interested in New England history. <laughs> And okay, the woods. Great. And the woods. Yes, it's it's terrific. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, another one from Francesca. Um, she says a more serious question. What's your writing routine if you have one? Do you have any problems with procrastination, like maybe wandering out to the garden when you should be writing? Um, any <laughs> tips for those who do have problems with procrastination? And how did you go about finding an agent? So uh, let's see. There are a lot of questions there. Let me see if I can. Writing routine. Ready, writing routine. So I am best in the mornings. So when I am in production mode, meaning, you know, I've signed the contract and I have a deadline, uh, I try to write 500 words a day, uh, any day that I'm writing. And I try to write five days a week. Uh, they're not necessarily 500 good words, but I try to get 500 words down before I get up and start doing other things. Uh, when I go out to the garden, because, you know, one does need to take a break, I set a timer. And when the timer goes off, I go back in as, as much as it hurts, uh, because otherwise I would be out there all day. Uh, because I also like to garden in the morning. I mean, basically, I'm a morning person. I do everything in the morning. Uh, let's see. Do I have, I don't really have a problem with procrastination. I'm just when, you know, when I have a schedule, I get it done. Uh, so that's just, sometimes it's not easy being me. Uh, sometimes. And then, easy. um, how about, uh, she, she asked about finding an agent. Ah, well, I cheated. So, uh, my niece is a literary agent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when I, I wanted to be a garden writer. I was, you know, I had a corporate job for 20 years. Um, and, and I always gardened on the side. And I met with Jenny and said, I'd like to be a, a garden writer. And she said, literally, she said, well, you're nobody. And to write nonfiction, you have to be somebody. So you have to go get to be somebody and then come see me. <laughs> harsh <laughs> uh now she did then say you know this is what you would have to do you know you'd have to start writing articles for smaller publications and get a you know some publishing published clips you know some credentials and start teaching or some other kind of you know public speaking or you know something where you're uh, and it, if you think of it from the publisher's point of view, they want someone who can help market the book. Mm -hmm. Because unlike fiction, you know, fiction, you write the book and then you, you know, you find an agent and then they pitch it if they think it's good, right? Nonfiction is not like that. So that's, you know, that was how I found an agent. It took a couple of years for me to like do enough that I convinced Jenny that yes, you know, she she could work with me on a proposal now and, and pitch it. 
with some. And what did you do? Did you write write articles or? Um... Yeah, yeah, I wrote articles starting with a no pay free. I think it was a monthly or maybe every other month magazine for senior citizens in my county, a garden column. That's how I started. You know, it was, you know, very humble. And then I started teaching at the local adult school, teaching gardening classes. But mm -hmm. you have to start somewhere. Sure. So that yeah. you can then build up. So it it was a process, not an event. Uh, you know, she said, if you want to write about a transition from corporate life to something else, you know, yeah, we could we could pitch that. But <laughs> but that's what I had experience in at the time. So anyway, that's kind of a little nutshell. See, sometimes even nepotism isn't enough. <laughs> oh, it sounds to me like you really put in the work to become your dream of a, of a, a nonfiction garden writer. Um uh let's see oh um wanted to ask um um uh, jean asks is is there a type of garden related murder that you've seen more often than others that's more common across these stories uh, i um, think probably the most common are plant poisons and weed killer you know th <laughs> those are the most common ones that show up uh right you know maybe it's just because those are the obvious ones but you know it was interesting for me because i'm not a toxicologist luckily i have a big family so i've got a cousin who's married to a toxicologist so he could help me with the poison chapter i mean you know it's like i had information but i wanted to make sure that i had the science right you know, it's not a scientific book, but, you know, you want to make sure that you're using the words correctly so that, you know, if someone who knows what they're talking about is reading your book, they don't go, well, you know, this isn't right. <laughs> it's like a gardener watching a movie and you go, those two plants don't bloom together. Why, you know, how could that be? You know, those don't bloom in the spring. <laughs> Why are they showing dahlias in this scene? <laughs> Yes, yes, those details matter. I do think that there's um, an opportunity for a, a, a mystery writer out there to use that Japanese dart digging knife that you showed. Oh, yes. What a lethal looking tool. Yes, uh, yes. I mean, it truly is. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and finally, um, I want to uh, ask you if you if you have any more um, literary related gardens that we should visit uh, besides Sissinghurst and that one in Ireland. Um, oh, you know, you mean in murder mysteries or uh, uh, mystery, general... sorry, mystery videos. Yes. Uh, hmm. Those are the main ones. The the others were primarily fictional, although there have been mysteries. There have been Central Park murder mysteries. Uh, uh, I know one of my former students claims that she's going to write a mystery about new, the New York Botanical Garden. Uh, I'll bet if you if you worked on it, you would find other botanic gardens that have been mentioned. I think sometimes people choose a fictional location just because it's easier in case that, you know, they get something wrong. Oh, wait, I see someone has put in the chat. I used to grow monkshood. Yes, monkshood is really toxic. Uh, <laughs> And uh, see, there's a nut, there's a common theme her, here. She says, my husband used to laugh and say that I'm going to do him in as all of the plant is toxic. Yes. And it truly is. It always surprises me because when I see it in the nurseries in the fall, it's a beautiful plant. It has this just spectacular blue bloom and it looks like a hood, right? That's why it's called monk's hood. Uh, it's why one of the Ellis Peters, uh, books it was called monk's hood for you know it's like nice with with brother cadpile uh but again every part of the plant is toxic and you know so don't put it near your vegetable garden but then lots of plants are toxic you know i grow this this is a, a pencil plant it's a kind of euphorbia so it's actually related to like poinsettias um, i love it because i worked at a garden about 20 years ago and this was there was a big kind of tree size of this in their children's education room 
And so I took a cutting and it, it's the toughest plant on the planet. You know, you just, you can forget about watering it for months and then water it and it's fine. Um, and so, you know, it's a sort of goopy thing. It's also got some toxicity. So if you cut it, you know, what you do, you have to prune it once in a while. Uh, you have to be careful not to get it on your hands because it will give you a rash, not as bad as poison ivy, but well, at least not unless people are hyper or sensitive to it, but it, it can really give you a rash. So many, many plants are potent. All right, thank you. This has been such a pleasure. Um, so thank you so much, um, Beth. I can think you will join me in saying this has been a, a real pleasure to do. And um, thank, thank you, you all for being here as well. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Good night. Bye-bye.